On Women, Abridged, by Clara M. Thompson, selected from Interpersonal Psychoanalysis, read by Vincent Bagnall. The women's liberation movement of the mid-20th century has given courage and a new sense of self, a fresh perspective and a new identity to women frightened and confused by the cultural and personal conflicts arising from the rapidly changing conditions and value systems of contemporary Western industrial society. At the same time, however, the movement has tended to oversimplify, seeking the solution to problems of great complexity in a narrow and angry aggressiveness, conceived and expressed in the competitive dog-eat-dog terms of the commercial marketplace. Clara Thompson's work is a refreshing antidote to this negative aspect of the women's liberation movement, while yet illuminating and defining what is valuable in the movement. In the light of recent findings in the physiology and psychology of women, her contribution stands today as fresh and solid as when it was first written. No innovator, but rather an astute clinician and inspired practitioner, Clara Thompson nevertheless, through her clear grasp of the relevant and useful in the works of others, gave impetus to a major development in psychoanalysis in America, the evolution of recent years from the libido theory of Freud to a humanist interpersonal psychology with its more flexible techniques and psychosocial approach. Her book, Psychoanalysis, Its Evolution and Development, was the first effort made by a psychoanalyst to integrate the various theories of Freud, Adler, Jung, Ferenczi, Reich, Sullivan, Fromm, etc. In her practice, she did not confine herself, as did many of her contemporaries, to merely suitable neurotic patients, but recognized the positive potential of many. Considered hopeless by her colleagues, whose problems involved conflict with the restraints of conventional society, the homosexual, the single woman, the schizophrenic, Her central philosophy was a passionate belief in psychoanalysis as an instrument for discovering and developing the true humanity, however submerged or atrophied, of the individual patient. Her emphasis in practice, as in theory, was placed on the sensitive and acute analysis of the interplay between persons in the growth of a human relationship. In short, interpersonal psychoanalysis. Biologic Aspects Before any extensive study of the problems of womanhood in our society is undertaken, I shall attempt to state clearly the biologic facts which distinguish her from man. These fundamental differences exist and cannot be overlooked in any appraisal of her position in a given society. This statement seems so self-evident that it need not be made, yet militant fighters for women's rights have tried to ignore or even deny this fact. In trying to show that a woman is just as good as a man, the tendency often has been to prove she is just like a man. Obviously, she is neither exactly like a man, nor is she totally different. She shares many capacities with him, but the difference remains. The nature and extent of the biologic difference must, in some respects, inexorably assign her to a different role in life. Of course, the most fundamental difference is the fact that she has different genitals, and they have a different function. She also has breasts which are capable of producing milk. These are not only anatomic differences, but through the hormone productions of these organs, they have a far-reaching physiologic effect on the body. And some writers believe this also influences the emotional reactions and even the personality. Since many other factors influence the last two, the purely biologic influence is difficult to evaluate. Even the exact influence of the hormones on the body, as well as on the emotions, is found to vary widely among individuals. In general, the female has a voice of higher pitch than the male. She's smaller, more delicately built, her hips are broader, and she does not have and is not built to have the muscular strength of the male. She also does not have a beard, simply to mention some of the most outstanding differences. Margaret Mead reports that these secondary sexual differences are not uniform throughout the world. Among the Balinese, for example, the female's approximate what we call the male type of build, 
and the males approximate our female type of figure. Also, in some races, the male has very little beard. I do not believe hormone studies have been made on any typical examples of these other cultures, and consequently we cannot state how deep-seated the difference is. In our own society, we have as variations within the group the woman with the boyish build and the male with broad hips, as well as numerous other irregularities. It also has been observed that modern civilized man who no longer engages in such strenuous physical work as his ancestors shows less difference from the female in body structure than his primitive ancestors. This was observed in comparing skeletons. Whereas in primitive skeletons, the sex is easily determined, the findings in examining the bones of modern man are often inconclusive. This conceivably is a variation due to changed occupation, since a great number of men no longer engage in strenuous physical labor. But whatever differences and changes occur in secondary sexual differences, two things remain constant in all races. Women alone bear children and lactate. It seems reasonable to assume that the hormonal differences between the two sexes have some effect on the way the one or the other copes with life. There is perhaps still some question whether the differences affect attitudes and activities other than those specifically related to the sexual life. Benedict and Rubinstein, in studying the relation of ovarian activity and psychodynamic processes, have presented material to show that there is a definite relation between mood swings of aggressivity and passivity, dependency attitudes and independence, and the differing hormone production of the various phases of the menstrual cycle. And while the problems with which each woman has to cope are the result of her personal experiences, the way in which she copes with them, for example, with aggressiveness or with depression and resignation, according to these writers, is contingent upon which hormone is dominating the picture in the course of her four-week cycle. Other research workers question whether such a strict correlation of attitudes with hormone production is true in all cases. In short, they have not obtained such uniform results as Benedict and Rubinstein. Therefore, it is not certain just how much of this is purely organic effect. The way one feels is certainly much influenced by the society in which one lives. Its customs, its attitudes toward work, education, and sex. In addition, personal life experiences leave their mark on the individual. Certain physiologic activities are recognized by all societies as belonging exclusively to the female. The attitudes toward these activities may vary from culture to culture. Menstruation, pregnancy, childbirth, lactation, and the menopause are universally recognized as female experiences. There are records of a few males who have under unusual circumstances lactated, and some who have had something approximating a menstrual cycle, even with bleeding from the nose or axilla, for example, but this is not the usual run of male behavior. More subtle and yet to some extent biologic are the differences in sexual response of the two sexes. Since the male has a penis and ejaculates, and the female has no penis and does not ejaculate, we can assume although we cannot know with certainty, that there is a qualitative difference between the subjective sexual experiences of the two sexes. It may be that this has some influence on the general personality, although at this point it becomes increasingly difficult to separate biologic and cultural influences. Numerous studies of male castrates and hermaphrodites have not shown a predominance of homosexual tendencies or desires to be feminine in them, although one would expect if biology alone were the determining factor that those deprived of typical male organs would seek different types of emotional expression from the normal male. And when it comes to actual sexual interests, it would seem that emotional factors in early life experiences are in the majority of cases more important than the biologic endowment. But the fact still remains that the female sexual response is qualitatively different from that of the male. There seem to be some differences in the biologic development in the two sexes, even in childhood. According to statistical studies, girls mature faster than boys. And this is apparent very early, and in fact seems to be the case up to and including puberty, which usually occurs in the girl about two years earlier than in the boy, at least in our society. And from this point on, statistics seem to accord the greater achievement to the male.
That is, when he catches up with a girl, he rapidly strides ahead of her in most types of development and achievement. And here again, one would need extensive cross-cultural study to test the universality of this statement. In all societies, the child is educated so early in the customs by which he must live, and the attitude of adults toward male and female children is so distinctly different that much that seems evidence of a future male or female character must be acquired from the environment. The difference in anatomy is usually discovered by most children between the ages of two and three, if they have any opportunity to observe it. The fact that the genitals can be a source of pleasurable body sensation is also discovered very early. It is questionable whether we can call the feelings thus aroused sexual in any adult meaning of the word, Freud so assumed. He thought that early sexual sensations in the little girls developed only at puberty. It was his assumption that the girl child did not even consider her vagina until puberty. But there is evidence that many children also discover the vagina early. It is my observation that when the vagina is early discovered as a pleasure zone, it frequently remains the most important source of pleasure throughout life. Culturally, we have been educated to think of women as having less sexual drive than men. On this basis, it was assumed that they could endure abstinence indefinitely. And this was the rationalization for the double standard of sexual morality of the Victorian era. Observation of animals does not seem to confirm this, according to Ford and Beach. The sexual drive of the female in heat is insatiable. One female at that time can exhaust several males. Benedict's and Rubinstein's reports also show in women a periodic insistence on sexual activity, which, when frustrated, results in tension, irritability, and resentment. It seems that the sexual drive in women shows a more regular periodicity than in men, but it is no less insistent. At the same time, it is more possible for a woman not to be aware of sexual tension as such than it is for a man, since she's not aware of the erection, although the clitoris is capable of some degree of erection, and does not have an ejaculation, sexual need may be experienced merely as vague general tension. Girls may masturbate for years without experiencing orgasm or being aware that such a reaction is possible. Again, the absence of tangible evidence, such as the male ejaculation, makes its discovery less certain. Nevertheless, many girls do discover orgasm when it is once discovered. It becomes a regular part of sexual experience. There seems to be more than one type of orgasm in the female. Some women have a sharp convulsive climax, followed by relaxation and loss of sexual desire. Except for the absence of ejaculation, this type of experience seems to be very similar to that of the male. But whatever these experiences are, they do not have the effect of complete discharge of tension at any one moment. Some of these differences are often related to emotional difficulties or inhibitions. That is, the woman does not have orgasm completely because she cannot permit herself a sufficient degree of emotional freedom to give herself up unconditionally to the experience. And when this is the case, there is a change in the type of orgasm in the course of analysis. All that one can say on the purely physiologic level is that women seem to be capable of varying degrees of orgasm, as well as orgasm originating in two different areas, and that the whole picture is overshadowed by psychogenic factors. Psychoanalytic Theories to psychoanalysis belongs the credit for the first intensive scientific study of the psychology of women. In the 1890s, Freud greatly disturbed the Victorian world by announcing that it was not possible to ignore the sexual life of either sex without serious consequences. He came to this conclusion from the revelations of his patients. As a result of his findings, he dared to say that women also have sexual needs and desires and that the denial of these can produce neurosis. Since many patients' problems took them back to memories of their childhood, Freud presently became concerned with the sexual development of the child. His observations, based chiefly on the reminiscences of adult patients, have furnished some of the framework of child psychology. Since his early pronouncement, great numbers of children have been observed during their early years, many of Freud's hypotheses have been confirmed, but others are more open to question, especially his conclusions about the sexual development of women. In fact, he himself was not satisfied with his theories about female development. And since the psychoanalytical theories about sexual development have permeated present-day thinking 
on the subject even more than most people realize. Freud's early observations applied more to the male than to the female child. He at first dismissed the female as having the same picture as the male in reverse. Thus, the Oedipus complex, one of his earliest discoveries, is described as the little boy's desire to get rid of his father and sleep with his mother. The hostility and rivalry in relation to the father and the erotic interest in the mother were considered universal experiences in the development of the small child. The female child seemed to have a similar situation, with the parents reversed. The little girl had an erotic interest in her father and looked on her mother as the rival she would like to supplant. This simple contrast on further investigation proved to be unsatisfactory to Freud. The relation of children to their parents was much more complicated. Freud concluded that the Oedipus situation did not occur until some time between the ages of three and five, and it became apparent to him that the relationship of children of either sex to at least one parent, the mothering one, had significance in his development before the Oedipus stage. As soon as Freud began to observe the emotional interactions of the earliest years, he concluded that there were more important points of difference in the development of the two sexes. The father, according to his observation, does not figure much in the life of the child before the age of three. The first development is one of oral dependency upon the mother. The newborn infant is completely helpless and must depend upon someone for everything. It is thought that he at first is not aware of himself as something separate from his environment. The mothering one furnishes a protection. The mothering one furnishes a protecting medium which the child does not differentiate from himself and to which he relates predominantly through his mouth. At this stage, both sexes have the same type of relationship to the mother and the activity which dominates the picture is nursing. Freud did not stress other aspects of this earliest relationship, such as closeness to the mother's body, but this is probably also an important experience for the newborn. Certainly, for the great majority of women, there is still no financial security comparable to that of marriage, and socially a woman alone is at a disadvantage. And these are very real factors in her craving for permanency. However, it is a fact that many pregnant women find real satisfaction in the thought that they have a gift from the mate constantly with them if they love the mate. It also may produce a genuine distress if they do not love the impregnator. Another aspect of the Freudian theory is that women are incapable of object love. With the renunciation of her clitoris, she supposedly gives up the active, conquering aim of seeking an object, and henceforth cannot love, but only can permit herself to be loved. And this is supposed to stem from the disappointment of not being able to win the mother because the girl has no penis. Thus she is condemned to lifelong inability to love, certainly a dubious concept. Even while postulating this, psychoanalysis continue to talk of mother love. They get around this by saying love of the child is really love of part of herself, and therefore not true object love. In my experience, there is much evidence to show that the inability to love is not sex-limited, but is found in those who have never been loved in childhood. While it may be true that a mother often gives more love to her son than to her daughter, and thus the daughter might more often be unloved in childhood, this is by no means a universal finding. Even when a child is not loved by the mother, she may receive love from the father, nurse, grandmother, or someone. The absence of any loving relationship in childhood invariably produces serious personality damage in either sex. Perhaps there are actually fewer women capable of love than men, but I doubt it. While there are questionable aspects to Freud's theories about women, it is important to remember that no one else has, as yet, presented anything comparable in detail and specificity to his contribution. In fact, most observations of significance stem from Freud's thinking, even when they contradict it. There seems to me to be a particularly basic fallacy in his theory, although many of his observations are empirically correct. And that is the idea that a woman is essentially a castrated male. She's supposed to have started life with a boyish outlook, which necessitated a difficult reorientation at puberty and which condemns her to a lifelong envy of the male. Many facts which led to this conclusion are the product of cultural attitudes. And a woman's psychology, with all its problems, is something in its own right and not merely a negation 
of maleness. Childhood. When a child is born, all too frequently a boy or girl is hopefully awaited. If the child turns out to be the wrong sex, the parents are markedly disappointed. The reasons for preferring one or the other vary greatly. There is a patriarchal consideration that a man wants a son to carry on his name and perhaps his business, or especially in America, that he may have the advantages which the father lacked. Or a girl may be desired because there already is a son or sons. Well, whatever the prenatal attitude toward the sex of the child, from birth on the actual sex subtly influences the reactions of the significant adults toward the baby. And one woman who had always been somewhat militant in her insistence on the equality of men and women, found to her amazement that her attitude toward her girl baby was different from the way she had felt about her sons. In spite of myself, I feel more protective of her, she said. In short, whether we have consciously thought about it much or not, most of us have a collection of attitudes toward the female which are different from those we have toward the male. Some of these attitudes make sense in terms of biology and physiology, but a great many of them are cultural stereotypes. Freud was of the opinion that the boy outgrew the Oedipus phase more completely than the girl. He offered as a theoretical explanation the idea that the boy's incestuous interest in his mother roused his castration fears and that he presently renounced his interest in her because of this fear. The little girl, on the other hand, Freud felt, had no incentive for giving up her attachment to the father since she had no penis to lose. An alternative explanation to Freud's may lie in the fact that in the average home, there is more tendency to be protective of girls than of boys. Boys are encouraged to find their way, to do things on their own, fight their own battles. Girls tend to remain under parental protection longer and more completely than boys, and there is much less encouragement in independence. Therefore, girls tend to keep their early ties to the parents longer than boys. As puberty approaches, the feeling of difference increases. And since girls usually mature a year or two before boys, the chasm between one-time playmates widens and a sense of mystery deepens. All of this sense of difference is usually reinforced by various rules, which are more stringent as they apply to girls, unless there has been a serious traumatic experience. By the age of 12, a girl is well on the way to becoming a woman of our particular social order. A period of close association with one's own sex usually begins a year or so before puberty and extends into the early part of adolescence. An increasing need for intimacy at this time is responsible for the first close friendships. Often there are groups of girls who may call themselves a club or may just get together. They often have a secret language or exchange secrets. The beginning puberty changes in their bodies are a source of mutual interest, and information and misinformation about sex are frequent topics. One group of grammar school girls met from time to time to inspect the progress of growth of each other's pubic and axillary hair. Later, the growing breasts were subjects for comparison. This displays an essentially healthy curiosity in the dramatic changes of bodily development. Of course, misinformed groups can succeed in frightening each other quite severely. The intimacy between two people of the same sex is a very important event. As Sullivan has pointed out, sometime between the ages of 9 and 12, the capacity for love develops. Prior to this time, what the parents call love in the child has been heavily colored by dependency. At this point, however, the capacity to care about what happens to another person appears. Her happiness is your happiness, and her sorrow, your concern. As the sexual drive begins to mature, little understood emotions emerge toward boys. There is excitement, self-consciousness, a feeling of awkwardness, and sometimes defensively, a feeling of contempt for the boys. The changes in the body and these feelings about boys are often discussed in the intimate relationships between girlfriends. Sexual experimentation with each other also occurs, and many a parent becomes concerned that she has a budding homosexual on her hands. The healthy girl moves on from this, however, to an interest in the opposite sex. If a girl reaches adolescence having acquired a capacity for healthy companionship with her own sex, she is well on the road to emotional maturity. 
Those who have not achieved such pre-adolescent intimacy will come to grief in trying to negotiate the more difficult step of heterosexual intimacy. Adolescence. The onset of adolescence is marked in both sexes by a physiologic event, the beginning of the function of the sexual organs. Around this event in all cultures has collected an impressive number of attitudes, customs, and even in many cases, rituals. From the onset of puberty, every young person finds himself in a new situation. Even in the best of situations, the maturing of the lust dynamism, the last of our biologic dynamisms, creates complications in our society. Up to this point, the child has been encouraged to exercise his powers as they develop. The mastery of the anal sphincter brings rewards of approval and admiration. The child's first steps and first words produce occasions for rejoicing. It is quite otherwise with the maturing of the sexual function. One of the most complex and powerful forces within us is subjected from its onset to stringent social regulations. In fact, in our society, this amounts practically to prohibiting the exercise of this new function for many years, and this attitude prompted Sullivan to call us the most sex-ridden people of whom I have any knowledge. In other words, the necessity for rigid control of the powerful lust drive means that it is more or less ever-present in our thoughts, especially of the adolescent, all of which contributes to the fact that with us, adolescence is a period of storm and stress. In girls, the actual physiologic demands are usually less overt than in boys. There are no erections or ejaculations insistently forcing sexual needs into consciousness. However, the periodic appearance of menstruation makes complete ignoring of all the genitals impossible. Instead of the more focused and acute feelings of lust experienced by boys, the girl finds herself unexpectedly tense irritable, and longing for love in a vague way. But the adolescent girl must not only cope with the natural forces within, she must also learn to make this new part of herself conform to the standards of her social order. Prohibitions have been stronger for the female and punishment for violation of the rules more severe. World War I introduced women into industry on a big scale and the sexual revolution began. The emancipation of women from their sexual inhibitions made the old control of the adolescent more difficult. Necking, petting, and all degrees of sexual intimacy, often in cars by the roadside, became the rule of the day. The change came too rapidly to be reasonably assimilated, whereas before, a sexual experience in adolescence was a disgrace. In the 1920s, sexual activity among high school girls was very frequent. In fact, among some groups, you weren't properly initiated into adolescence unless you had tried it. It was part of a general rebellion and demand for equal rights. What a man can do, I can do, was the slogan. And this applied to sex as well as to work or career. In the 1930s, there was some swing of the pendulum back to a more conservative standard in sex. But there are still great discrepancies in the attitudes of different communities and in different social groups in the same community as to what constitutes socially acceptable sexual behavior in adolescence. Although there are problems arising from the present attitude of excessive permissiveness, there are positive gains also. Sex today is something that can be talked about. It is possible for the adolescent to get accurate information. Most pre-adolescents today do not look forward with fear to the onset of menstruation. The greater frequency of sexual activity does not mean that our adolescents are necessarily free from inhibition. Just as girls in the past did not succumb to sexual overtures for fear of social disapproval, many today undertake sexual activity for social approval. Promiscuity is mistaken for freedom. Sex becomes a commodity, useful in buying a boy's attention or in buying popularity. Often the girl is frigid, thereby testifying to the fact that the experience is not genuine for her. In short, our adolescents have not reached the simple acceptance of sexuality that they're seeking. In attempting to be uninhibited, they have for the most part oversimplified and devalued the situation. 
Sex still remains in the human an important expression of intimacy. Its performance can express all types of relatedness from the most satisfying to the most hateful. We have seen that in pre-adolescence, the young boy or girl has the possibility for the first time to care in an unselfish way about the happiness of another person. It remains for adolescents to present the next step, the relating of this to the sexual drive. And this was difficult to do when sex was considered something dirty or evil. It is equally difficult to do when sex has become a commodity. Hence, the adolescent girl today can become as confused about the real importance of sex in her life as her grandmother did, although the emphasis is different. Nevertheless, the greater sexual frankness of the present generation offers a less constricting background for growth to the girl who is healthy enough, psychically, to be able to utilize it. Penis envy. Penis envy is a term coined by Freud and used by him to describe a basic attitude found in neurotic women. The term had more than symbolic meaning to him. He was convinced that this envy in women grew out of a feeling of biologic lack, beginning with the little girl's discovery in early childhood that she lacked something possessed by the little boy. Because of this, according to Freud, she believed that she had been castrated and she dealt with this shock either by sublimating the wish for a penis and the wish for a child, that is, becoming a normal woman, or by the development of neurosis, or by a character change described as the masculinity complex, a type of character which seeks to deny that any lack exists. In brief, it has been shown that cultural factors can explain the tendency of women to feel inferior about their sex and their consequent tendency to envy men, that this state of affairs may well lead women to blame all their difficulties on the fact of their sex. Thus, they may use the position of cultural underprivilege as the rationalization of all feelings of inferiority. The position of underprivilege might be symbolically expressed in the term penis envy, using the penis as the symbol of the more privileged sex. Similarly, in a matriarchal culture, one can imagine that the symbol for power might be the breast. The type of power would be somewhat different, the breast standing for life-giving capacity rather than force and energy. The essential significance in both cases would be the importance in the cultural setting of the possessor of the symbol. Thus, one can say the term penis envy is a symbolic representation of the attitude of women in this culture, a picturesque way of referring to the type of warfare which so often goes on between men and women. The possibility of using the term in two ways, that is, as actually referring to a biologic lack or as symbolically referring to a feeling of inferiority, has led to some confusion in psychoanalytic writing and thinking. It would make for greater clarity if the term were used only in representing Freud's concept. However, as psychoanalysis has developed, new meanings and different emphasis often become attached to an old term without any attempt at precise restatement. Consequently, the term penis envy is used by many without very exact definition, and this may lead one to assume that Freud's concept is meant when the thinking is actually along cultural lines. It, therefore, seems worthwhile to clarify the present-day meaning of the term. It seems clear that envy of the male exists in most women in this culture, that there is a warfare between the sexes. The question to be considered, though, is whether this warfare is different in kind from other types of struggle which go on between humans. And if it is not actually different, why is there such preoccupation with the difference in sex? I believe that the manifest hostility between men and women is not different in kind from any other struggle between combatants, one of whom has definite advantage in prestige and position. Two things have contributed to giving the fact of sexual difference a false importance. Penis envy and castration ideas are common in dreams, symptoms, and other manifestations of unconscious thinking. Body parts and functions are frequent symbols in archaic thought. 
These ideas then may be only the presentation of other problems in symbolic body terms. There is not necessarily any evidence that the body situation is the cause of the thing it symbolizes. Any threat to the personality may appear in a dream as a castration. Furthermore, there is always a temptation to use some obvious situation as a rationalization of a more obscure one. The penis envy concept offers women an explanation for their feelings of inadequacy by referring it to an evidently irremediable cause. In the same way, it offers the man a justification for his aggression against her. Sexual difference is an obvious difference, and obvious differences are especially convenient marks of derogation in any competitive situation in which one group aims to get power over the other. Relations with their own sex. All human beings, unless they are living under very unusual circumstances indeed, have some type of relationship with their own sex as well as with the opposite sex. This is not remarkable since about 50% of the human race is of the same sex as oneself. It is also not strange that the rules society makes about the way one should behave toward one's own sex are different from the rules of behavior toward the opposite sex. As in well-known from the study of comparative cultures, customs concerning these relationships vary greatly from culture to culture. In ancient Greece, for example, a homosexual phase of development in the male was recognized and sanctioned. In Western culture today, such an aspect of male relationship is not sanctioned. It is true that homosexual activity in early adolescence is recognized by the psychologically more sophisticated as a normal, transient phase of development. But, with this possible exception, all other homosexual activity in our society is not only considered abnormal, but also marks the unfortunate individual with a social stigma. In fact, according to the laws of some states, such a person is considered a criminal. Because of this, it seems unfortunate that in developing his theory of bisexuality, Freud chose to use the word homosexual to characterize relationships with one's own sex whenever there was any degree of friendship or intimacy. The use of this term with its derogatory implication has, I believe, served to increase self-consciousness about friendly relations with one's own sex. For example, in Freud's partial analysis of an adolescent girl who had a crush on an older woman, the patient is labeled homosexual, although no overt genital activity occurred. The term has an even more damaging effect when it is applied to what is called unconscious homosexuality and latent homosexuality. It is my feeling that the use of such a term not only unnecessarily frightens the patient if the therapist uses it, but also tends to prejudice the therapist against the patient. Therefore, I have chosen to write about all types of intimacy between women, labeling only the situations with overt genital activity as homosexual. In childhood, if a girl happens to grow up in a neighborhood where most of her age group are boys, if she's a healthy child, she will find ways of making herself acceptable to them. She may, for instance, become a tomboy, that is, a baseball player, tree climber, or whatnot. Similarly, a lone boy in a neighborhood of girls somehow gets himself included in the girls' games. His role is a little more difficult because he is more likely to be teased about it at home when and if he encounters boys of his own age group They will be pretty rough about any sissy traits he may have acquired. But again, if he's a healthy boy, he will quickly outgrow any girlish characteristics he may have copied from his early playmates. As adolescence approaches, the healthy girl gradually turns her interest away from her chum toward boys. A frequent experience in this midway stage is the sharing of infatuation thoughts. Each remark, each overture of a boy, is related in great detail to the girlfriend. Together they speculate and giggle. In fact, part of the pleasure and attention from boys at this time is sharing the experience with the chum until presently a special boy appears. Confiding in the chum becomes less important. Indeed, if one girl has reached the boy stage ahead of the other, her increasing indifference to the chum can cause many a reproach and heartache. From adolescence until marriage, there is a growing absorption in the opposite sex. Double dating represents a remnant of the old chum relationship, but on the whole, a girl's concern is with a boy or boys. 
It's very important to be popular, not only because it is fun in itself, but also because at this stage, it increases one's value in the eyes of a particular boy. Still unsure of his own judgment, he is greatly reassured about the worth of the object of his interest if most of his fellow companions are attracted to her, too. External appearance is very important at this stage. One must strive to be as nearly as possible the type in fashion at the time. This leads girls to become competitive with one another, and so it is a factor in breaking the chum relationship. After marriage, most women in the United States turn again to their own sex for much of their companionship. During the long day while the husband is at work, it is the woman friend with whom one shops, plays bridge, goes to the movies, gossips, and discusses things. Associating with other men in the absence of the husband is a taboo in most American groups. Usually a woman makes an appointment alone with a man other than her husband only if there is a business or professional reason for the contact. There are groups where this taboo no longer holds, but these are more emancipated groups found chiefly in metropolitan areas. Thus, relationship to one's own sex again becomes important. In fact, for the conventional woman, it becomes the only possible intimate relationship besides the one with her husband. The degree of intimacy with other women or another woman may vary greatly, but in some form the greater proportion of a woman's waking life is spent with her own sex. Actually, in some communities, even evening social life shows a pretty complete cleavage of the sexes. At a dinner party, only cocktails and the meal are shared. After dinner, the men play poker, while the women gossip or play canasta, often in separate rooms. And even when there is no formal division, the conversations are likely to be separate. The men discuss business or politics. The women talk about children and domestics. Thus, the life of the middle-class American married woman is often almost entirely devoid of male companionship. And such isolation is not quite as true of her male partner, who at least has his secretary or woman co-workers. When the relationship between two women goes beyond mere social necessity and a degree of intimacy exists, we again find something comparable to adolescent discussion of boys. The topic this time is husbands and perhaps sexual difficulties. This, in brief, is the picture of the normal homosexual life of the American woman. If she has not been made self-conscious about her relation to women, she may spend many happy hours with her best friend, perhaps daily, while watching the children at play. There may be quite open demonstration of affection, such as hugging, walking arm in arm, even kissing. Women are still much freer in such matters than men, for whom the social taboo on demonstrativeness is stronger. On the other hand, especially in sophisticated groups, both men and women are becoming afraid to give any open demonstration of affection to a member of their own sex. The borderline between a normal affectionate intimacy with a member of one's own sex and a pathologic homosexual attachment is not sharply defined. Thus, two adolescent girls, especially if they've been subjected to strict curtailment of contact with boys, may be inseparable write love letters to one another, embrace, even fondle one another's genitals without any permanent homosexual fixation. As soon as there is opportunity for association with boys, the intensity of their attachment to each other begins to diminish. Later in life, similar situations are sometimes found. For example, a woman widowed in her 50s sometimes finds a younger woman to mother in love. With her, there may be, quite definitely, the feeling that caring for somebody, almost anybody, is better than no love at all. The younger woman in this situation may be more pathologically homosexual. There are groups of women who cannot believe they can be accepted by either sex. By relating themselves to the type of male who must reject them, they perpetuate their own conviction. They have no friends of their own sex, and in the group of male homosexuals, they remain the outsider. In short, women who cannot have a good relationship with their own sex cannot have a satisfying relationship with men either. Capacity for genuine affection for members of one's own sex is essential for healthy human relationships in general. Role of Women in This Culture When Freud first wrote his studies in hysteria in the 1890s, he described a type of woman with ambitions and prospects very different from those found in the average psychoanalytic patient of today. 
That a radical change has occurred is partly due to Freud's own efforts in clarifying the whole question of the sexual life, but largely due to changes in the economic and social status of women. These changes were already occurring before the time of Freud. In this country today, women occupy a unique position. They are probably freer to live their own lives than in any patriarchal country in the world. This does not mean that they have ceased to be an underprivileged group. They are discriminated against in many situations without regard for their needs or ability. One would expect, therefore, to find the reality situation bringing out inferiority feelings not only because of a reaction to the immediate situation, but because of family teaching and childhood based on the same cultural attitude. One would expect to find also very frequently resentment toward men because of their privileged position, as if the men themselves were to blame for this. These are some of the more important factors that contribute to a woman's feeling of inferiority. As we know, the culture of Europe and America has been based for centuries on a patriarchal system. In this system, exclusive ownership of the female by a given male is important. One of the results has been the relegating of women to the status of property without a voice in their own fate. To be sure, there have always been women who, by their cleverness or special circumstances, have been able to circumvent this position. But, in general, the girl child has been trained from childhood to fit herself for her inferior role, and as long as compensations were adequate, women have been relatively content. For example, if in return for being a man's property, a woman receives economic security, a full emotional life centering around husband and children, and an opportunity to express her capacities in the management of her home, she has little cause for discontent. The question of her inferiority scarcely troubles her when her life is happily fulfilled, even though she lives in relative slavery. If, therefore, the problem of a woman today simply referred to their position in a patriarchal culture, the task would be much simpler. However, without considering the fact that the individual husband may be unsatisfactory and so produce discontent, other factors are also at work to create dissatisfaction. As Eric Fromm has said, when a positive gain of a culture begins to fail, then restlessness comes until a new satisfaction is found. Our problem with women today is not simply that they are caught in a patriarchal culture, but that they are living in a culture in which the positive gains for them are failing. Industry has been taken out of the home, Large families are no longer desired or economically possible. Also, other more emotionally tinged factors contribute to the housewife's dissatisfaction. The home is no longer the center of the husband's life. If one adds to this the fact that the sexual life is often still dominated by puritanical ideas, the position of the present-day wife who tries to live in the traditional manner cannot but be one with a constant narrowing of interests and possibilities for development. Increasingly, the woman finds herself without an occupation and with an unsatisfactory emotional life. On the other hand, the culture is beginning to offer her something positive in an opportunity to join in a life outside the home where she may compete with other women and even with men in business. In the sexual sphere too, with the spread of birth control knowledge and a more open attitude in general about sex, there's an increasing tendency in and out of marriage to have a sexual life approximating in its freedom that enjoyed by the male. However, these things do not yet run smoothly. And in other words, we are not yet dealing with a stable situation, but one in transition, therefore one in which the individual is confused and filled with conflict, one in which the old attitudes and training struggle with new ideas. Women's restlessness began to make itself felt about the middle of the last century. Prior to that, and even for some time afterward, the position of women was fairly clear-cut and stable. Her training was directed toward marriage and motherhood. If she made a good marriage, she was a success. If she made a bad marriage, she must try to adjust to it because it was almost impossible to escape. If she made no marriage, she was doomed to a life of frustration. Not only was sexual satisfaction denied her, but she also felt herself branded a failure who must live on sufferance in the home of her parents or of a brother or sister, where she might have a meager emotional life from the love of other people's children. Not only must she suffer actual disappointment, but she had the additional burden of inferiority feelings. She had failed to achieve the goal demanded by the culture, 
and for women there was only one goal. There were a few exceptions, for instance, the Brontes, although leading very frustrated lives, at least were able to develop their gifts and to achieve success. But work and the professions were for the most part closed to women. If one's own family could not provide for an unmarried woman, she might find a home as governess or teacher in some other family. However, there were occasional daring women. As early as 1850, a woman had crashed the medical profession. She was considered a freak and accused of immorality. She had to face insults and jibes from her colleagues. And very slowly, the number of women physicians increased. Still later, they entered the other professions in business. On the whole, the number of women who in one way or another became independent of their families before 1900 was small. World War I speeded the process and gave the stamp of social approval to economic independence for women. And since then, she has been able to enter almost every field of work for which she is physically capable. But even yet, she is seldom accepted on equal terms with men. Cultural Pressures in the Psychology of Women The importance of cultural influences in personality problems has become more and more significant in psychoanalytic work. A given culture tends to produce certain types of character. In the neurotic personality of our time, Karen Horney has described well certain trends found in this culture. Most of these neurotic trends are found working similarly in both sexes. Thus, for example, the so-called masochistic character is by no means an exclusively feminine phenomenon. Likewise, the neurotic need to be loved is often found dominating the life of men as well as women. The neurotic need of power and insatiable ambition drives are not only found in men but also in women. Nevertheless, in some respects, the problems of women are basically different from those of men. The biologic problems of a woman's life cannot be ignored, although it would seem that in most cases biology becomes a problem chiefly when it produces a situation which is unsatisfactory in the cultural setup. Menstruation, pregnancy, and the menopause can bring to a woman certain hazards, of which there is no comparable difficulty in the male biology. Freud was so impressed with the biologic differences of women that, as is well known, he believed all inferiority feelings of women had their root in her biologic inadequacies. To say that a woman has to encounter certain hazards that a man does not, does not seem to be the same thing as saying a woman is biologically inferior, as Freud implies. The fact that bearing children must influence women's personality development cannot be denied. Also, the type of sexual response characteristic of a woman conceivably has its influence on her character. For example, it seems probable that the very fact that the male must achieve an erection in order to carry out the sexual act and that any failure in this attempt cannot be hidden, while the female can much more readily hide her success or non-success in intercourse, may well have an effect in the basic character patterns of both. Even here, however, more complete understanding of the cultural pressures is necessary before it can be stated in what way or to what extent biology plays a part. But one thing seems fairly certain, namely that to the extent to which a woman is biologically fulfilled, whatever that may mean, to that extent she has no tendency to envy man's biology or to feel inferior about her biologic makeup. In certain cultures, women can meet with difficulties which would make her biologic makeup appear to be a handicap. And this would be true when her drives are denied expression or when fulfillment of the role of woman puts her at a disadvantage. And both of these situations are true in many respects in the United States today. And this is essentially a patriarchal culture. And although many values are changing and these changes on the whole are working to the advantage of women, the patriarchal situation still presents limitations to a woman's free development of her interests. Also, the newer situations have their hazards in that they usually throw women into unequal competition with men. By unequal, the reference is not to biologic inequality, but an inequality resulting from prejudice and the greater advantages offered the male. The official attitude of the culture toward women 
has been and still is to the effect that woman is not the equal of man. This has led to the following things. Until very recently, woman was not offered education, even approximately equal to that given a man. When she did secure reasonably adequate education, she found more limited opportunities for using the training than did a man. Woman was considered helpless, partly because she was not given an opportunity to work and partly because she had no choice but to be economically dependent on some man, and social restrictions were placed on her, especially in connection with her sex life. These restrictions seemed to work to the advantage of the man. The assumption of women's inferiority was a part of the prevalent attitude of society and until very recently was accepted by both sexes as a biologic fact. Since there is obvious advantage to the male in believing this, he has proved much more resistant to a new point of view on the matter than have women. Women, at the same time, have had difficulty in freeing themselves from an idea which was a part of their life training. Thus it has come about that even when a woman has become consciously convinced of her value, she still has to contend with the unconscious effects of training, discrimination against her, and traumatic experiences which keep alive the attitude of inferiority at the same time that the life previously traditionally expected of them has become in many ways more unsatisfactory since the beginning of the 20th century. Middle class and professional women especially are unhappy confining themselves exclusively to home activity. They feel left behind with their innate capacities going to waste even during the years when their children are small and their time is fully occupied, many of them have a feeling of futility about what they are doing. And even more, the alert married woman, whose time is no longer fully occupied with small children, feels apologetic and unimportant. On the other hand, very few women are satisfied with the opposite choice of being a career woman without marriage. They also usually feel apologetic and failures, and one finds each type envying the other. The bachelor woman? is still not as socially and economically secure as the bachelor man. Economically, she is seldom as well paid, and she is discarded sooner than the man as she grows older. Socially, she has fewer opportunities for stimulating companionship. She is much less welcome at a dinner party than an unattached male. The popular belief is that stag parties are fun, while hen parties are boring. The validity of these assumptions can be questioned, but they give us a picture of the attitudes women must face. The unmarried career woman, therefore, has a feeling of inferiority as well as a lack of fulfillment. The inferiority feeling is due in part to her not having entirely discarded old standards, i.e. a feeling of humiliation about failing to marry. A restless loneliness is one of the most frequent problems leading unmarried career women to seek psychoanalytic help. Even when she finds the work she is doing satisfying, it does not adequately compensate for human intimacy and children. Many women have partially solved the problem by having affairs or by establishing a homosexual menage. Affairs are precarious because they give no security for companionship in old age. Try as they will, act as emancipated as possible, most women who have not married have a feeling of failure. On deeper probing, one finds doubts of themselves as women. A great number of affairs seldom reassures a woman that she's accepted or loved. She may talk very loudly about her independence, but when she begins to feel indications that the current man is about to depart, she is very disturbed and feels that she is a failure. She does not often succeed in taking sexual experiences casually. She usually has a tendency to want to bind the man. About this matter, married women often have similar difficulties because of present-day ease of divorce. Men, on the other hand, are supposed to be less concerned about permanency. I say supposed because I wonder how extensively the fantasy life of the two sexes on this matter has been compared, because it has been easier for the man to put his fantasy into action on this point. Have we perhaps erroneously assumed he has more desire to do so? However, there are one or two points about a woman's desire for permanency which should be considered. First, has the ever-present possibility of pregnancy built a deep biologic need for continuity into woman's nature? Many writers believe that this is the case, that the woman feels she has received a very special gift from the man which ties her to him, while a man conceivably thinks of his semen more as something discarded and having no further interest for him. Whether this attitude holds true basically for human nature in general cannot be demonstrated, 
And certainly in matriarchies, women have seemed not to need this continuity. Second, we know that in our society, other factors contribute to it. Our women have not the assurance of a long-established tradition of independence. Many have no training, which would make it possible to live comfortably on what they could earn. And even when they are highly trained, most of them feel relatively helpless and weak in the competitive world. And they do, in fact, have a harder time than men. So for the great majority of women, still there is no financial security comparable to that of marriage. Also, the divorced woman has a little harder time socially than the divorced man. She again becomes the extra woman, while his status may continue the same or actually be improved. In short, much of a woman's craving for permanency is a result of tradition and her economic situation. The matriarchal woman does not seem to have needed to be firmly attached to a particular male. If the society in which a woman lives permits her, a woman is able to fend for herself and her young. Our present industrial culture does not favor it. We have seen that the fulfilled early life generally leads to a productive middle age, that serious frustration and discontent in the early years can lead to mental illness and despair in the middle years. Our last consideration is, do difficulty and unhappiness earlier have to lead to more unhappiness later? One example is a woman who consulted me many years ago. She was about 50 at the time. She was married to a mean, parsimonious, hypocritically religious man whose temper had always terrified her. She had four children, the youngest whom was then 13. All of the children had serious emotional difficulties. In fact, from her description, the youngest seemed well on the way to schizophrenia. Needless to say, the woman was an excellent example of the menopausal type of panic one sees when the awareness of an unlived life dawns on a person. However, there was a quality of vitality about this woman that made me feel something could be done for her. She went far beyond what I had dreamed of for her. She had a native knack of being able to help people feel out their difficulties. But she had no education beyond high school and no type of training. Soon after her few talks with me, this was not an analysis. She left her husband, although he made it as difficult as possible for her, proceeded to put herself through college, taking a few courses a year while she supported herself doing this and that. Today, she is a teacher and counselor in a sanitarium for crippled children and has a regular column in her local newspaper on parent-child problems. I think she will get a degree in another year. It is true that her Past life has left her with personality difficulties, but she has had a rebirth, and she has more possibilities for growth and development than ever before. Also, her two younger children have shown improvement with her change. There is also the woman of 50 who hopes by dyeing her hair, having her face lifted, and wearing youthful clothes to have the sexual charm and allure of a woman of 30. She is doomed to failure in her attempts at salvaging her misspent life. People sometimes come to analysis for miracles. One must first face and come to terms with the fact that one can never make up for the lost years. One can hope to live from now on. And for that, middle age is not too late to begin, to begin with the pleasures and satisfactions possible in middle life.